Let's begin with prayer. Father God, we praise your name for you are holy. We praise your name for you are good. We praise your name because you are God. And we give you praise. We worship you. We thank you. And Lord, I pray that you, that we here together would exalt you, would praise you, would worship you, that you fill our minds and our hearts with your word and your spirit. Lord, I pray we take all the things that we may be thinking about, all the Maybe the struggles or problems, we just, and just Lord, we would just look to you for our strength. We would look to you for our help, for you are our help. Thank you, my Lord. Guide us as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God created humanity to know him and live with him and love him. Our home, our purpose, and our meaning are truly found in God. We are wandering vagabonds, lost in our own sinful, selfish self, unable to find the path that leads us home. We are unable to even recognize that we are lost. God created us to know him. God created us to live with him. It has been God's will for you to know him. That is why when we talk about the great doctrine of salvation, we're talking about God's work to bring us to him. The heart of God is revealed to us, and his desire is known. In Jeremiah, we read this, Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. That phrase in this verse speaks to God's heart, They shall be my people. This is repeated a few chapters later in Jeremiah 31. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will be their God, and they will be my people. That is the will and heart of God. That's what he desires for you and me. The prophecy of Jesus is in Isaiah that's fulfilled in Matthew. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means what? God with us. When we ask what salvation is, this is it. God with us. God living among us. God living within us. The apostle John saw the incredible majesty of the incarnation When God stepped into our world, born as a baby who grew to be a man, when John wrote, and the word became flesh, and what? Dwelt among us. God with us is how we read that verse. God with us. Salvation is God with us. Our future and our hope is God with us. The entire crux of God's heart is on display in the Bible. When we read in the Psalms, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God, that's how we read it, God with us. When David prayed, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to acquire in his temple. He is crying out, God with us. He's saying, I want to be with you, God. I desire nothing else but you. He was crying out. He was crying out for salvation. That ancient blessing in Numbers, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That prayer blessing is saying, God with you, God with us. When Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. He was saying, God with us. God with us. Our hope, our message, and our lifestyle is God with us. We proclaim it. We live it. We declare it. We invite others to know God with us. We say, we want you to know that phrase. We want you to know that reality. God with us. When we want to, we, we say to all who will hear, it's time to come home. Time to come home. You're lost, but God is calling you for he desires for you to be with him. The whole reason Christ came was to demonstrate the reality of God with us so we too could stand in his presence. He will walk with us. He will carry us in his bosom. He will love us. He will watch over us. He will bring us home. Our Lord God does not have it in for us. He doesn't want to destroy us. He does not take delight in the death of the wicked, but rather he wants the wicked to turn from their ways and live. 
God did not send his son to the world to judge the world, but rather that the world might be saved through him. God is rushing toward us to save us, to heal us and restore us so we can go home and we can find our home and we can know that beautiful phrase, God with us. Is that what you desire? In the depth of your soul, in the depth of every soul is the cry and need for God, for that reality, for that truth, God with us. Because of that, we can say God is for the whole world, for every person who was created for God. He was created by God and for God. No matter the cultural, no matter their beliefs, no matter their status, no matter their gender, age, disability, education, everybody needs to know God with us. And the only way they can know is if someone tells them. The only way they can know is if the gospel is spelled out for them. The only way they can know is to see the sin in their heart and how lost they truly are. But there is the God who's holding out his sa- hand saying, come home. Come receive forgiveness. Come know the power of my love. God with us. What a beautiful truth. What a merciful act. I want us to celebrate the reality, God with us. I want us to know it, celebrate it, rejoice because of it. As Paul concludes his letter to the Romans, he wants the church to recognize the mission of the church that is rooted in the character of God and the person of Christ. He wants the church to keep its eyes on Christ. He wants the church to live in the like-mindedness of their calling, which will compel them to missions, to serving, to loving and healing. The church is the means by which God will bring transformative change to the culture. It's the way he wants to bring a healing to the sinful souls and forgiveness and an invitation to come home. He is calling the church to never stray from Christ, and to, but in fact grow down deep into Christ. The church is the body of Christ, and as such, the church will reveal the very reality of Christ to the culture and the world around it. The message of God with us is for the whole world. It is for those closest to us and those farthest away from us. Together, we will accomplish all that God wants, but together we will do it. As Paul called the church to present his bodies as as its body is a living sacrifice, what that does is it brings transformation and a renewed mind. A new renewed mind, a reconciled mind, a holy mind, a Christ mind. This mind leads uh, to a desire and action. It leads the church to live in the manner Christ lived, with the attitudes that he had. It's his first reaction is love. God's love will be bleed through you. His grace revealed and his mercy proclaimed. The church called by Christ, empowered by Christ, is a generous, compassionate, holy church filled with the message of God with us. Will you not know the one who loves you? Will you stop running from the one who cares for you and know this one beautiful truth, God with us? Number one, walk as Christ walked. Let's look at Romans 15, start with verse 7. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. A man named Yang he had a son named Mott, and he belonged to the Bunong people, a tribal group in Cambodia. And Mott met the Lord when he moved to a city to continue his education and stay with the Christian dorm parents. And for years, he was the only believer in his family. During one of his visits home to his home village, Mott be prayed in his home. He welcomed the Holy Spirit and breaking the curses of the mountain gods that had been placed in the home. He then began playing the guitar and worshiping Jesus. And as he sang, the high shelf that was holding this mountain god, idol, crashed to the floor and just shattered. And his father, Yang, rushed in saying, my, my son, what have you done? Now I will not believe in anything, not in the mountain gods and certainly not your god. Well, Yang held to that statement for years before his heart was softened toward the truth and he slowly turned to the Lord. 
During that time, his vision began to deteriorate. Yang had actually already had lost a, a vision in one eye due to a trauma decades earlier. Now his remaining eye was becoming uh, cloudy. And Ma approached Christian missionaries to ask for advice, and they referred Yang to Mercy Medical Center for evaluation. He made the day-long trip by bus from the province and underwent successful cataract surgery. After Yang returned home with restored vision, he was able to read the beautiful words of the gospel in his own language for the first time. And Yang became a follower of Jesus Christ, freely sharing his story with the other villagers. He says, I received my sight back, and then I could read God's word for myself. And now I believe in Jesus. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. God with us. The beautiful story of redemption never grows old, right? You could hear thousands upon thousands of those stories of how people are, are found by Christ, receive forgiveness, and truly free in life. The wonderful events of God's mercy is expected and celebrated. When you look at the man Yang who was hostile to God but eventually relented under the weight of God's kindness, rece he received the mercy of God. He saw the unlimited love of God poured out upon him. His unbelief was overcome by belief. His doubt removed by faith. Salvation was received. He now knew that beautiful phrase, God with us. So number one, receive one another. That really stands out in verse 7. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us. We are to approach one another in Christ, with Christ, and because of Christ. We are to approach the lost and the saved in Christ, with Christ, and because of Christ. We are to bring Christ into all our situations, in all our circumstances, and in all our relationships. We must bring Christ into everything. Every day I ask us to pray this prayer. It should be on the back of your insert. Lord, I have one request. You are my one request. You're my one desire. Reveal all of you in me, and may I decrease and you increase. In all that I do and all that I say and all who I meet, let it be you they see. In Christ's name, amen. I ask and challenge you to pray that prayer. As we approach others, we bring Christ. As others approach us, we receive them as Christ received us. How did Christ receive us? He loved us into his presence. He loved us into his presence. He sacrificed for us so our sins could be forgiven. He came down from heaven to walk among us. He endured the penalty of our sins, and he suffered through our sinful actions. He loved us. He, how did Christ receive us? With open arms. He came to serve and not be served. He came to give. He received us to bring glory to God. As we receive others, we receive others to bring glory to God. We receive others in the manner where God is worshipped. We want our relationships with others to be holy, marked by Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We want to receive others in the manner that brings praise to our God. For he is the one whom we live for. He is the one we want to honor. He is the one we desire to make known. I want you to know my friend. I want you to know Christ. When we receive others as Christ received us, we become mindful of the mission of God. The closer we get to God, the more mission-minded of, of his heart we become. Christ came with a mission. Christ came with a calling. He came to die for our sins. He came to rise again to defeat death. He came to reveal the Father. He came as a servant to his people. Here Paul called them the circumcision. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the Jewish people, the circumcision. Christ came specifically to his people, the Jewish people. He came to confirm what the prophets had said. He came to reveal that the prophecies were fulfilled in him. He came to prove that the law was complete in him. There are two things that stand out about how Jesus was received. When Christ was born, no one knew. <laughs> he was in, born in Bethlehem and laid in a manger. Angels even proclaimed, hey, Jesus is born. <laughs> no one knew. Shepherds had, were coaxed to go and, hey, go and see. <laughs> Wise men from the east even came to Jerusalem asking about the birth of a king. Hey, where is the one born king of the Jews? Herod, who's very paranoid about other people ruling. Not really the wisest thing to say to Herod. And so what does Herod do? He goes to the priest and says, hey, where is he going to be born? 
And, and, of course, the priest answered, but don't you think the priest would have been intrigued by that? Why are you asking? Is there something we should know? They don't even ask. Second, we read this in John 1. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. You know, in some ways, verse 10 makes sense. Even though God created the world, the world does not know God. They may know idols. They may know things about God. But they don't recognize him, and they don't expect him. They were blind to him and his coming. The world did not know its creator, nor desire to welcome him. It would be like me if I went to a different country and started walking around. Nobody would know me, but that would be okay because they wouldn't know me. You know, I'd just be another face in the crowd. I would expect that. Nobody would come, hey, we know you. No, they wouldn't know me. Nobody would know me. But what if my closest friends, my deepest relationships, and my family ignored me and did not receive me? That is what you read in verse 11. His own family, his own people did not receive him. But yet even though his own did not receive him, as we read here in Romans, he sought to make himself known and to serve his own people. When he spoke, he revealed the word. He, he revealed the Father. All that he did, he demonstrated the God that his people were to know or supposedly knew. It was to be without question the God who called them to his own. They would recognize him for sure, right? They would recognize the phrase God wisheth. They would say, yes, this is the God we worship. Look at what he's saying. Look at what he's doing. Certainly this is the God we know. We recognize his mercy, his grace, his words, and his love. And they didn't recognize. But God does love his people. He did want, his, but he did not just want his people to be his people. He wanted people to know that he was for all people to be his people. He wanted the Gentiles. He wanted the Jews. He wanted us. He wanted people to welcome and receive Christ and to know him. His heart has been for the whole world. It was David who cried out the verse that you read here in uh, verse 9. Or, yeah, verse 9. The Gentiles should know the God who created them. They should know him. As Christ served his people, his people are to serve the world to make sure others hear his name. Are you called to bring that message of Christ? Are you able to go to another place where they speak a different language, who worship a false god, who are lost in their ways, floundering their direction, and say, let me show you the God who loves you? You're never too young and you're never too old to serve those around you and bring Christ to those around you. Listen to God's heart. Follow his calling. Fulfill the calling he gives you. Walk in victory and know that phrase, God with us. Number two, God is for the whole world. Verse 10. For this reason, I will confess, or excuse me, and again, I don't know, time, I got to start reading, getting readers, I think. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. Justin Wren, an all-American wrestler in college, easily moved into the world of MMA. Anyone know what MMA stands for? Mixed Martial Arts, that's right. But as his success and popularity skyrocketed, so did Rand's addiction to cocaine, sadly. It was cocaine, alcohol, and narcotics in his life then. Of course, what happens when that happens? It always hits rock bottom. A very common tale, sadly. And he was kicked off the world's best fight teams for drug use. And Justin Rand said this, My childhood dream had turned into a living nightmare. But when everyone else had written me off as beyond redemption, one friend, Jeff, refused to walk away. He called me several times a day, invited me to a Christian men's retreat. I was expecting a bunch of kumbaya moments around the campfire, but the men were raw and real about their struggles. So after opening his life to Christ, Ren wanted more than MMA fighting or fame. He started volunteering at local ministries in prison. He wanted to share his story. He didn't care who. So he started talking about his story to whoever would listen. Then he offered this prayer, God, I'm yours. Is there anything you want me to do? I desire to do your will, not mine. 
And God answered his prayer with a vision of working in the jungles. In the Bible passage, Isaiah 58, 6 through 12, about God's heart for people, poor and oppressed. And so Rand explained what happened next. I shared my vision with my mentor, he said, Caleb, and he immediately knew I was describing a Mubuti or pygmy tribe in the Congo. He told me I was leading a group there in a month, and he encouraged me to go with him. Our goal on this trip would be to find the most remote Mubuti villages in the jungle, form relationships with them, and learn more about their needs. I saw firsthand that circumstances there were graver than I had seen in my vision, and after several months back home, I could, still, could not shake my burden. So Caleb, his friend, connected him to Shalom University, a Congolese Christian school dedicated to serving that group of people, the pygmies. And he knew that he couldn't uh, help them unless he understood them first. So he said, I'm going to just live with them for a year. And he lived with them for a year. He slept in a twig and leaf hut, ate their food, suffered them from their diseases. One bout of malaria nearly killed him. But no matter how tough things got, he felt more at home than he had ever had in the gym. And and he was soon adopted into the pygmy tribe. And he was given a a new name, Ifiosa Mubuti Mangbo. Mubuti Mangbo means the big pygmy because he's six-something and the pygmies are (laughs) four-seven. And Ifiosa means the man who loves us. What a great name, the man who loves us. Recently, after a five-year hiatus, he returned to the MMA cage with the goal of raising money for a fight for the Forgotten, the organization that he founded to serve the pygmy people. The drive to fight is still there, but he's no longer fighting for his inner demons. He's fighting to fulfill God's call in his life. Justin Wren wanted to let this know, this, to let these people know, to let this group of people know that beautiful phrase, God with us. So he went there and he told them. He was used of God to approach the pygmy people because of Christ in his heart. Number one, rejoice with God's people. You know, that phrase again, that, that phrase stands out as well. Rejoice, O God, Gentiles, with his people. God is inviting the world to rejoice with his people. He's inviting the world to worship the creator, the Lord Almighty, the sovereign king. God is for the whole world. To rejoice with God's people is an invitation. To praise the Lord means you know him. There are people in this town, in this country, who have no idea, or maybe they have an idea of who God is. They have an idea. They imagine a God. They think they know God. And this God that they know is not the God who created them, though. The God they know is a combination of ideas, experiences, and arguments. It's a jumbled mess of false revelation. They think God is unjust, unfair, cruel, a warmonger, a cat ready to pounce, a mean-spirited man who enjoys watching us suffer. But they're not describing God. They're describing themselves. For the God we truly know is self. Our God is not ready to pounce. He's ready to forgive. Our God has lavished upon us his love, and he's showered us with his grace. He's poured upon us his mercy. Where is our mercy? Where is our justice? Where is our grace? People are lost in their false understanding of the God who loves them. Who will go and show them the true and living and loving God? The Bible says in 1 Timothy, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Our God is the Savior of all men. He is the living God. Our God desires God with us. There are so many who are caught up in an idea of a God. Even us can get lost in the false ideas that may cloud our thoughts, but his character is true. His love is real. His salvation certain. His forgiveness solid. Who will go and make known so that they they can be invited to worship the true and living God and know the God who loves them, who created them, so they can worship and praise him? Will you go? God wants all of us to know God with us. And number three, Christ is far above all. Verse 12, it says, And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall have hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
George Ladd, a New Testament scholar who, from 1911 to 1982, that was his life. He was a great, amazing New Testament scholar. He said this, God alone who has told us that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony unto all the nations will know when they, that objective has been accomplished. But I do not need to know. I know only one thing. Christ is not yet returned. Therefore, the task is not yet done. When it is done, Christ will come. Our responsibility is not to insist on defining the terms of our task. Our responsibility is to complete it. So long as Christ does not return, our work is not done. Let us get busy and complete our mission. Christ is the image of the Old Testament of the Old Testament that becomes clear in the new. He is expected in the old, he is revealed in the new. He is the root of Jesse, the son of David, the king of the Jews. He's the one promised by God when God said to Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. Christ is that blessing. Christ is the fulfillment of the promises that God had made. He is the greatest revelation. He is the reality of God with us. So number one, Christ is coming and has come. In Isaiah 11, the prophet said, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its, his roots. Then, verse t- then a few verses later, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Even the Gentiles shall seek him. Even the world shall want to know him. God is not partial, for he wants all to come to him. He wants all the lost souls of every generation, of every culture to know him. It is the expectation of the Messiah, the calling for all to know God is rooted in Christ. He wants every lost soul, every generation, every culture to know Christ, to know God with us. Christ is not for one generation, for one tribe, for one people group. He's for all of the world. He's for you and for me. Christ was expected in Isaiah's time. He is an open invitation to the Gentiles. He is coming, and his coming is a promise to you and me, to the Gentiles, to the Jews. He has come to reign. He has come to save. He has come to overcome, and he's come to bring hope. As Paul closed out this section, he again, like in verses six and 5 and 6, recites a doxology. Why does he do this? Because we, how can we not worship the one whose love is so great and so wonderful? He calls God the God of hope. Is that what you see God as? The God of hope? This doxology is a prayer that we are to pray. First, the church is to know God of hope, the God who gives us hope, true hope, a certain hope. The church is filled with joy and peace. The church is to know the quietness of the presence of God in the midst of the chaos of evil in which we live in. The joy and peace is the presence of God. And finally, the church is to abound in hope, filled with the Holy Spirit. The church is to be renewed by the Spirit, strengthened by the Spirit, motivated by the Spirit, called by the Spirit, compelled by the Spirit, blessed by the Spirit. This will make the church move. This will make the church grow. This will make the church proclaim, God, you're holy. The church will know God with us, for God is truly with his church. The church will invite, proclaim with open arms and say, come home. Come home to the one who loves you, who has saved you, who will forgive you. Come and know the God who loves you. Come and know the God who wants you. Come and know the God who says, God with us. Let's pray. Father God, we proclaim and shout and declare you are holy, you are Lord, you are good. Oh, Lord, place your calling upon us. Compel us, Lord. Let us not sit quietly where we are, but to go and proclaim the message. Let us not be content with what we are doing, but to be compelled to go and fulfill your word. Let's not be complacent, Lord, but compelled. Thank you for that beautiful phrase, God, with us.